Aston makes it. There's kind of a new mic company. They're it's an awesome mic though. Very cool. Do you do you do it for vocals and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. Vocals and I mean, there's kind of only three things I really use a mic for in my house, which is a vocal or an acoustic guitar or a, some sort of percussion instrument. That's really the only thing that I ever mic. Um, are you? I think I hear your audio from your mic there hooked to Skype. That's good. How do how, you just do that through your interface and stuff? Yep. Check it. Make sure. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. That sounds good. You don't need to be up on it. Just whatever. Farther back's good. Uh, and then can you record your end of this conversation sent to me in a little bit? Yeah, if it's easy, just, it's quick time just the audio. Whatever. Yeah, just the audio. Quick time or Pro Tools, whatever you've got. Pro Tools is fastest. I just got to open it. Hold on. Boop, boop, be doop. And tell me uh, the name of the diet that we're talking check, about. So, check. Reva, did you already go live? You can check, check, put the, check. Put the, check. Check. Can you edit the copy? What's the name of the, the the? It's not just keto. We're discussing it's what. What'd you have the name for it? It's what? I mean the the people that I learned it from originally call it LCHF. Low carb, high fat. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean it's. I thought you said something with glycemic blood, something that you were referencing, even more specific than I had heard before. Well, the yeah, I mean the. I don't really, I don't really call it anything. It's, it's that's 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 the, I guess that's the name I like the most. It's the most um, free of. I think low carb keto. There's a lot of names that have a have kind of a bad mm -hmm. have miscon a lot of misconceptions. Atkins, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, that people don't understand. So. I try to either just say LCHF or just explain to people how I eat. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, are are you r rolling? Almost. Hold on one okay. second. Dooby 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 dooby. And we. Are rolling. All right. Well, thanks, Sprinkle. I'm glad to talk to you. Today. Yeah. Thanks for making Absolutely. some time for me, as you always do. Absolutely. Uh, so most people know you as the, you know, obviously the music guy, and you are the person that I probably learned the most from in production and music and stuff like that. But you're probably also the person that I think of or go to first when I want to talk about food and cooking because you know mm -hmm. you're. <laughs> You're my guru in that area, too. So I always ask you food stuff. Uh, is there something similar about that? Just to start off, though, with the food, is there some any direct parallel you would tie between the way you think about music and art and food? Yeah, I've had numerous discussions around that topic. Um, I think food is a creative expression or can be, you know, cooking mm -hmm. can be. And it's something that I kind of have emotional responses and mm -hmm. attachments to that are similar to music, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think what I one of the things I've learned about myself is I'm just kind of in general and an enthusiast. I just get mm -hmm. really into something, you know? Yeah. You're an enthusiast. Um, just an enthusiast enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. like um, and, uh, e evangelist is actually another way of putting it. It's obsessive like, person. <laughs> yes, very obsessive. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you know, and if I get into something, I can, I can very much become obsessed with it in an unhealthy way, but also in a – I think, you know, it has it, – it's a superpower if you know how to harness it, and mm -hmm. if not, it can get the best of you. Well, there's something maybe about food and music that's similar in that it's uh, it's like there's an unbelievable amount of technical knowledge that's both uh, un well understood and available and accessible. Like it's it's easy to get, 
Mm -hmm. It's well it's well documented and studied and known the technical stuff of how music works and what it is and same with food and then on the other hand it's just wildly subjective and it goes straight into Ta Absolutely. You know, taste yep. and objective and emotion and stuff. Yep. And for instance, an individual's metabolism is like, it doesn't matter how much you know about science, it almost all feels like it goes out the window when you start to apply it to a, something at a population level to an individual level. Mm -hmm. and, and not to mention preferences and, and all the psychological oh, yeah. stuff that goes in. So same with music. You, you can't. That's the same. You know. Yep. Exactly. Like you can, uh, you know, uh, it's the same exact thing where I would say you can't, decide if you like something or not you just do <laughs> that's interesting you can't decide if you like something or not you just yeah like you can't be mad at someone that doesn't like bacon right. even though Boys. everyone should like bacon yeah they if they really genuinely don't like bacon they did that's not a decision they made you know i i run i get tripped up on that actually now that you mention that i yeah. do get tripped up on the fact that they're like if somebody for instance let's just use bacon as an example if somebody tells me they don't like bacon i assume mm -hmm. that their stepdad stepdad beat them with strips of bacon when they were five yes. and that's Absolutely. why they don't like bacon but i don't believe they don't like the way it tastes i can't yeah no that. you you we you and i have actually had similar conversations in the past about this yeah i mean my initial thought is always like oh no how how was bacon ris misrepresented in your life right, in some right. way? How, how, what happened? Like, what, I, are the, I, where, what are the scars attached to that? Because <laughs> there's no way bacon, that but... you actually don't like it. You know what I mean? There's, that's not possible. So, Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Are you not having the – okay, so if you get technical there, are they not having – and I, I think bacon is – you should – bacon, pepperoni, pizza, pepperoni, yeah, cheeseburger. Pizza. It should be universally likable. Uh a lot of candy and sweets, I think, are that way. There's, mm -hmm. You have to be have something really going on to say it didn't taste good. You say, I don't like it. Yeah. You say, I avoid it. I think that it it's uh, bad for you and so much so that I don't like that. But I don't think you can objectively say some of that stuff doesn't taste good. Mm. Although it probably is true, but it's it's hard for me to swallow, pardon the pun, that it's uh, it's not an objective thing, uh, you know, uh, about human taste. Like, if you're seeing what I'm seeing, if you're tasting yeah. what I'm saying, if the if our frame of reference is the same, is there a physiological difference? Like, is it literally the construction of your taste yeah. buds don't let you like bacon? Yeah, it's yeah. I I have a I have a problem because I I basically fundamentally believe what I just said, mm -hmm. but I also have a really hard time with it. Mm -hmm. um, because I do, like Coldplay is an example, mm -hmm. where when people say they don't like Coldplay, I don't really believe that they don't like Coldplay. You think they're reacting to hipness or copy of Radiohead yeah. or the people that like Coldplay? Yep, right. whatever. There's something mm -hmm. that makes them think it's cool to not like right. it or they've brainwashed themselves into not liking it, but if they actually could listen to it in a sort of non-biased, sort of, you know, objective mm -hmm. way, that they would like Coldplay. And, I mean, that's just an example. Um, but I also believe that it's totally fine for them to not like Coldplay. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really hard. It's hard for me... <laughs> It's hard. It's really hard because I want I want to fix the problem. That's I want right, to get yeah. in there and be like, okay, let's let's get to the bottom of this bacon thing mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but I also I'm trying to learn to just be fine with things not being how I would see them as correct in the world. So <laughs> I'm really trying to learn that. So we'll get into the diet stuff specifically, but I'm, I'm kind of stuck here in this. In this yeah, I love it right now. But is it, uh, do you, can you take that non judgmental thing and apply it to music and food? Like, uh, can you say that people, it's okay for people to like, you know, really bad quality food. You know, for instance, I get in, in, into debates with people about Little Caesars all mm -hmm. the time because I think it's amazing. I love yeah. Little Caesars. I think it tastes great, and most people will tell me that it's not true, and I just yeah. I get lost there too. That's one of those ones. <laughs>
But yeah, you that, know, as I somebody mean, that, uh, that appreciates food on a deep level, are you offended by people like, for instance, and not necessarily Little Caesars, but people liking just you know Mountain Dew and Funyuns? So no, absolutely not. I, I have, I love, like in the deepest parts of my soul, a McDonald's cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. I love it. it um, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because that was like a coveted thing when I was a kid that I wasn't really, I didn't have very often. And so when I did, it was a really big deal. Maybe that's why. It could have nothing to do with how, the actual taste of it. Mm-hmm. It could have to do with some past experience. What I'd argue and, on the math of that is the reason that you'll find anybody disliking McDonald's cheeseburgers is not because that they're bad. It's definitely That's one of those for sure reactionary things because McDonald's cheeseburgers, if you just look at the numbers, would ha- yeah. obviously have to be one of the best foods ever created by yeah. humans that's the, been the, the most, most refined thing. Right, yeah. like they've put the most R&D possible into ma- mm-hmm. making the thing that the numbers don't lie that people want to consume. Yeah. And then people like to tell themselves they don't like it or something, but they, they do. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. So does that, if we do transition and talking about your diet and what you eat, which I think is, is, is neat, do you, do you actually do the thing where you go to McDonald's drive throughs and get a couple of McDoubles and throw the buns away? Um, I mean, I, McDonald's is a great place to order food for me. Yeah. I mean, they'll, anywhere will just make you whatever you want nowadays. You don't even have to throw the bun away. They'll just make it without it. Um, so what do you order at McDonald's drive through when you're hungry, you're on your way somewhere? Well, I usually, if I try, I try to get their breakfast stuff, Mm -hmm. just, you know, a couple of their breakfast sandwiches without, uh, without the bread you know without the muffin or whatever um it's just about you know this journey for me has been so crazy and so much learning and so many layers of kind of uncovering as I go to kind of learn more and take things to the next level and all that but you know it's the simply the way it started is the thing we've all heard a bunch, you know, which is just how many grams of carbohydrates you eat in a day. Right. Is really where it started for me. Was, how much do you weigh now? I weigh 160 pounds. What is the heaviest you were? Or the average heavyweight when you were? 225. Heavy. You were walking around at 225 for years. Basically. Yeah, yeah, or around, like hovering that. around there. Mm-hmm. And you're hot. You're like five seven. Not even five six. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Okay, so that just gives people a little bit of context if they've never seen you in full frame before. But mm-hmm. um, but you you hadn't been one sixty since I imagine you were twenty years old. One sixty. I think the last time I was one sixty was was definitely in my twenties, mm-hmm. like my early twenties. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And I'm actually still losing right now too. It's slow, but I am. Yeah. I don't, I'm not I don't I don't think I'm weight stable yet. Mhm. So well, whatever, whatever it is, I mean, I've, I've noted this on last time we talked on labeled podcast or something like that, but you're certainly the physically healthiest I've ever seen you in the time mm-hmm. that I've known you by a long shot. And that carries over in, I don't even, I mean, I think there's, I'm not saying there's intangibles about it, but it's at least weight and demeanor, neck size, maybe complexion, maybe other stuff. I don't, I don't really know, but it's, it's just like, it's a, uh, for somebody that doesn't see you often, it's just strikes me like. It's striking, like somebody that has plastic surgery that you didn't know, yeah. that you know and hadn't seen in a while or something. When I when I see you now, I'm like, oh yeah, this is like badass sprinkle. He's like yeah. looking so good, <laughs> and then that translates, I think, into mood and, and all those other other things too. So I know there's a lot of people that don't love the, the, a high fat or a low carb diet, but um, yeah. I would like to talk about it specifically and how you got to it, and and uh, you know, let's, I'd like to go more more deep into it. But you don't call yeah. it like a How'd you first encounter it, and what do you call it? Simp- the sim- simple beginning to the story is, well, I'll just I'll try to get through this quick, but I have yo-yoed since I was 20 years old. I've been gaining and losing, but always gaining more when I gain it back. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of the yeah. this. Yeah. 
Um, and I've done every literal thing probably that you've heard of uh, diet-wise to try to stop it, including I tried Atkins back in the day and even South Beach, which was kind of a low-fat, low-carb thing. Um, really just never, ever had any semblance of control or a handle on my health or weight or anything and really had no I didn't have any idea that I could you know after a while just felt so beat down and so uh hopeless mm -hmm. that I just kind of let go of even the hope of ever um feeling better than I did you know when I was a teenager or whatever yeah <laughs> and uh or as good as you know and then um, it was a couple years ago, a year and a half ago or so now, I, was, I went through another bout of kind of losing. I did, I did a whole 30 and lost some weight and then gained it all back plus some and just that kind of thing. I mean, we talked about it on the Labeled podcast, mm -hmm. that, that, that whole thing of how you see yourself, you know, that way that you can kind of turn your head and look in the mirror in a certain way. <laughs> And you, that's what you think of when you think of yourself, but seeing pictures of myself and just being really depressed. And then, and then my, you know, I, I had been diagnosed with hypertension. I was on, I was taking four pills a day for high blood pressure and it was barely under control. And, and then all of a sudden my A1C, which is, you know, your hemoglobin A1C, which is a kind of a, it's sort of a test that measures your average blood glucose level over about a three month period. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's basically a number that you hit when in, in the medical community, you're considered type two diabetic. And then there's a number, there's a window that you hit where you're considered pre-diabetic. Pre yeah. And I, I hit the pre-diabetic number. I think I was a 6.2, which is 0.2 away from, I believe it's 0.2 away from being, um, a full blown type two diabetic. Um, and I actually, once, when I found out that I was pre -di that close to being diabetic, I actually went and gained about 15 more pounds. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of like lost my mind. I was, I, I went into denial. I was very, I was very scared and freaked out. And my, you know, my doctor kind of got in my face and, you know, that was right, it was right at the holidays, too. It was right at, like, November, December, kind of when I... It's a bad time for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so after, I, in January, I saw a picture of myself. I was just really upset. It was really bad. I was e easily 225. I wasn't weighing myself or anything. I thought, I don't exactly know, but I, I definitely looked upsetting to me. Like, not beside, just besides the weight, it's just, I looked sad. <laughs> like I just looked puffy yeah, yeah, and yeah. sad and, and, but the thing is, is it was, it, now it was getting to where it was real. Like type two diabetes is not a joke. You know what I mean? It's, it's bad news. I didn't even know what it was. So I just started looking online and I found, I found a website eventually after looking and looking, just trying to find out if there was a way for me to not get diabetes or not have to be medicated for it or somehow figure so it out. I had to take insulin or something even? Well, they start you on other stuff first, but mm -hmm. you know, it depends on how high your A1C is. And that, and that really gets to the kind of crux of this whole thing. But I, I found a website called dietdoctor.com, which is a doctor in Sweden runs it. And, um, it's an LCHF kind of helps people kind of get started and low carb, high fat. Yeah. Low carb, high fat. It kind of breaks down and, and, and they, they focus a lot on, uh, type two diabetes and, uh, all, all the different things that go along with that. Um, anyway, I started learning about why, what type two diabetes is, why it happens, how it happens. And that it's reversible every time, always, type everyone. Two, so type 2 diabetes is always reversible. From yeah, I mean, diabetes. from the evidence that I've seen, the doctors that I follow online, their um, practices and 
their patients and their stories and other people's stories, it appears to be an, not a lifelong condition mm -hmm. that is completely reversible. Uh, Dr. Eric Westman at Duke University, Dr. Ted Naiman in, in the Northwest. Uh, these are some of the doctors that you, that um, treat it um, in their practices with food, 100% mm -hmm. food-based. And it's really just a it, – it, it's just a condition brought on – by excess dietary carbohydrates. It's called insulin resistance right. is what it is. It's where your body doesn't respond correctly to insulin, so it has to produce more. And and so you start out, I started out kind of seeing carbohydrates and trying to figure out, okay, how do I lower them? And I, I kind of understood like car, your body converts carbohydrates into sugar and so your blood sugar can be lower and that kind of made sense. Like, okay, if my blood sugar is lower, then that's good because diabetes is higher, blood sugar, type 2 diabetes. Well, let's talk about, right, let's just get in there about insulin and insulin resistance. So for people that don't know, I guess some people will know and some people will not, um, but what we're talking about is the way your body, okay, so your body needs glucose. It's its primary fuel, it's C6, H1206, I guess it is, uh, and it floats around your body, and that is the fuel that your body uses and your brain and, and, and everything else. But if it, if it gets high, what would you say? I said sort of. That, that what you're saying is sort of okay, true. Okay, well, correct me in a second then. Yeah. Um, and so insulin is a hormone that your body produces to counteract high blood sugar. You're with me that, there? That's not true either. Okay. Fix it. That Okay, so... Um, let me put it this way. So the way that people treat type 2 diabetes, I'm going to just qualify everything I'm saying and that, that I'm not qualified to say anything. Not a doctor. I'm, right, right. I'm not a doctor. This is my personal experience that I have discovered to work on me. Um, but from what I, the little bit that I've learned is that the hormone insulin has a lot of functions and one of them happens to lower the glucose level of your blood. Mm-hmm. But that's not its primary function. Okay. And and the problem with type two diabetes is, it is caused by too much insulin. Your body producing too much insulin uh -huh. is what causes it. And the way the medical industry or you know system treats it is they just look at your blood sugar level and they go, oh, you need more insulin to get it lower. Right. So people that and are diabetic, what, even type one, they'll give them insulin to counteract yeah, type dangerously one is a high blood sugar, totally which can kill you thing, it really quickly at a certain level. Yes, and type one diabetes is yeah. completely different. It's when your body doesn't actually have enough insulin. Right, it doesn't make it. But so the problem is, is insulin is actually a hormone among other things. But from what I have learned, it, its primary function is to tell your body to store fat. And tell your body to not use fat as fuel. Okay. All right. So this is this is interesting. So, I understand what you're saying, but I hadn't thought of it in this term. So and in doing that, it happens to lower your blood sugar. Okay. But th but it literally stops your body from burning fat as fuel and mm -hmm. tells your body to store fat for later in case of emergency. So what would what would cause your body to produce insulin outside of high blood sugar though? Eating carbohydrates. But that raising your blood sugar and then insulin kicks in yeah so uh, your body goes oh you're eating a bunch of uh carbs carbohydrates mm -hmm. sugar whatever we must be in a feast time where you're you know it's seasonally if you look at if you go back and look at how we ate before whatever modern agriculture and food industry. production or agriculture eat 100 you go all the way back to hunter gather seasonally we ate fruits, put fat on for the winter mm -hmm. to use the, that fat as fuel, right? You just think of it like a bear hibernating. I mean, yeah. that's an extreme example, but they feast it's exactly, a ton. And, yep. and, they, yep. and they, the idea during that feast time would be get me as fat as I can get. I've got yeah. all these berries. I'm going to eat some salmon too. I'm going to eat everything I can find. I'm going to get as fat as I can, and then I'll make it through when there's no. Yeah. So it's a signal, right? Mm -hmm. To your, tell your body, okay, there's going to be trouble later where we're going to need, we're not going to have 
mm-hmm. food. We're not going to have what we need, so we're going to put this fuel on our body. Right. We're going to and, store fat. That's the po- point of it. So let's try to get yeah, fat because so we're going to need it. Yeah, so your body can only store, I think it's around 2,000, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody that knows, calories of glucose. I know that it can store some in, in your muscles too, mm-hmm. for but that's kind of different. And it can store unlimited calories of fat. Right. So I think that if so, you, if, if I know what you're talking about there, you, that would be the actual glycogen in your liver. In your liver. That yeah, you're correct. storing. And that's only enough yeah. for a few hours. That's only hours yeah. a day or, you know, 40 hours yeah. worth of, yeah. of fuel. Yeah. And then you have so, to go into your fat reserves. Yeah, so what you can do is, so insulin resistance means your body becomes resistant to the effects of insulin, mm-hmm. right? And over time, like any anything we are exposed to chemically, hormonally, whatever, we, be, we can become resistant to. Um, so right. you, you become resistant because of overexposure. So you overexpose your body to insulin because you're causing this. So no we use caffeine. To, I mean, you just, get resi- you, know, you just have to have up the dose. Absolutely. Yeah. So we used to live and eat in a way that we wouldn't be triggering this response all the time. We didn't eat as much. Mm-hmm. We had days where we didn't eat. We fasted all the time. Not because we, we had, wanted to, because we just couldn't find anything. Just for a while. couldn't find anything. Yeah. yeah. So we, we were. We never ate like this. I mean, even if if you just go back, literally to the 1940s, the average American was eating a low carb diet compared to how we're eating now. Literally, like, the percentage of carbohydrates, if you look at the macros. The macros, yeah. I mean, it just, because all this processed food, packaged food, wasn't, you know, kind of pushed on us and the dietary guidelines and all that stuff. I don't want to necessarily get into all the conspiracy end of it. Just for me, this started clicking and making sense. So I was like, I learned that you can actually kind of switch your body from burning sugar, which Mm -hmm. is carbs, which most people in this country only ever burn. Only that. ever do their whole. That's so, it's all like, they. It's that feast whole mode life. all the time. We're trying to get fat for winter, always, three sixty five. And most people have never even entered. And most humans, at least most Americans, have never even entered a state of ketosis as long as they've lived. Mm-mm. And it's a whole other a whole yeah. <laughs> other way that is and part that, of our. That's way the other thing to too, Matt. Is I don't chase ketosis. I've yeah. never tested mm-hmm. my blood or yeah. anything for ketones. I don't necessarily at this at least at this point in my life I've never worried about that. I just know that if I get my carbs down mm-hmm. I started to switch over to to using fat for fuel. Right. And my body started using my fat for fuel. It started using some of the fat I was eating, but then also some of the fat on my that body. Had stored. And it was like this it unlocked this thing Mm -hmm. because I've done the low calorie, low fat thing a bunch of times, the most times of any diet. Um, and I think most people can say that they, what happens is you eventually kind of plateau Mm -hmm. on that. And all of a sudden you're, you're lowering even more and you're still not losing any weight because your body kind of adapts the whole, the homeostasis kind of moves over because what happens when you do just calorie restriction is your body goes, oh, we need to turn everything down because mm-hmm. we got to run. Systems is we don't have enough fuel here, so we're going to have to. We got to learn how to run on mode. this. Yeah, right. we got to learn how to run on this many calories. Mm-hmm. So kind of then you and especially when you're signaling insulin while you're low calorie, mm-hmm. then you're just all messed up and. I mean, when I finally figured this out and it started working, I just wanted to cry. I was like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, you, we've, we're always taught, like, eat less, move more, you know? You slob. Yeah. What's your problem? Yeah. You're just lazy. And I do exercise now, but I, I, it wasn't until I felt like I could by, <laughs> from, losing, from losing weight. Yeah. Till I got into that and just kind of taking it to the next level. I've, you know, I've since learned even more about just general insulin exposure and um, specifically what kind of foods work best for me and what makes me feel bad and what makes me feel good. But the first, the first thing I noticed immediately after the few days of just feeling horrible, 
because kind of when you're kind of converting over um, to fat burning, uh, it's kind of feels pretty bad uh, for some people, like most people. You find that that but though the more times you go back and forth, the easier that gets. Of course. I've never gone back since January of 2016. Okay, so I've, that, I've, that'll I've, be different I've than almost anybody else I've ever heard of. But you're saying since yeah. you started eating low carb, you haven't had a single day where you've eaten a couple hundred carbs? No. You've not had a, a, what they'd call a cheat day, but you've not even had a Thanksgiving dinner or something. I, you I would be back. surprised if I've eaten more than 20 grams of carbs in a day in the last year and a half. Wow. And, and most days it's about five grams of carbs. Oh, it's got to be more than five. It's I mean, there's five pretty, in, in, in. Pretty easy for me to hit five. Well, I want to talk about that. I, I find 20 to be what I would consider a minimum. But I mean, if you're talking carbs. net, too. Yeah, if you're net talking carbs. net or gross. Um, but, but that's just where I feel good. Mm -hmm. So the, the great thing about this, I've done a little bit of tracking and looking at macros and just kind of trying to see what my percentage is or what my cow, you know. At, you know, percentage of calories from fat, carbs, mm -hmm. protein, all this that. This is where I people start to get the red light immediately. When I try to explain yeah. it to them, that's the first thing I say. I say, well, don't worry about the name. and Don't say it's Atkins. Don't accuse me of only yeah. eating bacon, whatever it is. I yeah. say, let me just tell you how I think of it. I like to try, because I like to think about calories and macros and percentages. That's the most comfortable mode for me to be yeah. in, is to look at the component parts of, of what it is. So the macros being protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And so I believe... I like to eat, try to get 75% of my calories from fat. And then mm -hmm. I try to do as much protein as possible beyond that and, and the, the least amount of carbs as possible. But I'm not afraid yeah. of them. So I, I'll eat up to 50 carbs a day if I'm That's pretty to do standard. That. Well, but, and you, you, are, you look to me like mm -hmm. you're pretty insulin sensitive too. So you can probably tolerate more carbs. And 75% fat is kind of pretty standard mm -hmm. keto mm -hmm. macros. But I have not, I mostly don't do that. I mostly, here, here's what I'm doing currently right now is I eat when I'm truly hungry until I'm not anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I eat within a certain period of time each day. So I intermittent fast as well. Okay. Um, Even fasting if you're hungry is, during what you think is supposed to be a fast or is it natural that you just go long periods without eating? I have found, hours I'm, that? I'm really, I usually do 16 hours and, and then I do some days of 20 hours, but it's really interesting when you start figuring out what true hunger really is, especially for me. So much of my life when I was hungry, I was just wasn't hungry at all. It's just do you, totally do you mean another that that's thing. Either, well, p part of that might be habit. And ritual and social, but there's the, is the part absolutely. of like a blood sugar cycle. Is that something you identify well, falsely as hunger? I mean, that when I was towards the end of uh, the year and in, in uh, 2016 in January and stuff, I would pass out almost from eating. Like really similar feeling to like getting, like drinking a bunch really fast and kind of passing out. Like very similar, very weird. Like because my blood sugar would just go so high, like through the roof, and then crash down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that whole thing messes you up so bad. Your your satiety signals of your like carbs just mess all, all that stuff up. You can't. The amount of carbs I was eating. So, but you, but my your point body there can't being even that tell you if it's full or not. The or hunger, hungry or not. right? That's right. Because there's what's the hormone. Uh, there's a hormone that is, I'll think of it, you'll think of it for me, but there's a hormone that tells you you're hungry. What's it called? Do you know what it's called? Um, uh, it's, yeah. It ends with an I-N, like all the hormones. It's a. Uh, it's not leptin, is it? I'll look it up, but there's one of the, there's, there's, a, there's a certain hormone that's just one that tells you you are yeah, hungry. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I don't know all the names of all that stuff. I just know, for me, right, I, I'm learning what real hunger is. Fasting is kind of almost a hack. If you if, if if you start look fasting really freaks people out when you start saying that word they just lose yeah. their minds and run away, but we already fast every night. It's just kind of pulling that window of of not eating out a little farther, and your your mental clarity goes up. Your 
your human growth hormone levels go up, your adrenaline goes up a little Four bit. Four crash doesn't happen. Nope. And just so, like, just, I mean, the mental clarity thing for me has, and mood stabilizing of this mm -hmm. has actually become maybe the most mm -hmm. beneficial thing to me of yeah. anything. Because not only do I not feel physically as, like, just sluggish, mm -hmm. but my brain, I can focus longer. I can, I don't know. It, I'm, I don't, uh, my mood doesn't swing around as much as it used to. And, um, it's, it's really incredible. And, you know, like I said, this is my story. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people hearing this that are just think I'm insane or, um, whatever. But I just say, you know, try it. If, if you're having any sort of if you're anywhere near having metabolic syndrome, if you're anywhere near, you know, where I was, or even if you're just not feeling good. I, I mean, a lot of people that are thin eat the way mm -hmm. that I do yeah. for the mental reasons or inflammation. It really lowers your overall inflammation. You know, some sorts of chronic inflammatory diseases can be, r people can see really big improvements. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, I quit nicotine about five months ago now completely. I was, I, I hadn't smoked for a couple of years, but I was vaping. and I just don't think I would have even been able to do that if it wasn't for my kind of entire narrative shift that came along with this because it more than unlocking just my physical health, which can only is only temporary, right? It's all only mm -hmm. temporary because I'm going to die someday. It unlocked this thing where I kind of had this self speak of, you know, I can never do this. I can't do this. We talked about that a little bit too, but it, it was just such an awesome kind of gate way to this kind of whole new mm -hmm. way of thinking for me mm -hmm. um, and a new way to experience my faith and relationships and all this stuff. And by no means do I have it all down. I'm very, very much still in the growth stages and really trying to be able to look at stuff and figure it out. But How come you can't tolerate, for instance, a cheat day? It wouldn't hurt you, uh, you know, physically to, to do such as that. I don't. Because, I mean, that's I a big I don't barrier feel for a lot good. of people. I don't feel good. See, I'm, I'm at this point where I don't want, I don't see the value in it anymore, personally. I don't, there, the there's no. What's the you miss the most, though? I mean, that's where, that's, you have to understand, that's where I people's heads miss, are when they hear somebody I like know, you saying, and, I have and, not had anything truly decadent or sweet in a year if anyone <laughs> understands this this uh, it's me because i remember sitting in aa meetings saying there's no way that i will ever be happy if i can't drink anymore there's no way that i'll ever that anything will even matter like how could i ever <laughs> seriously that's how crazy i was mm -hmm. about it so I get that. I understand that feeling because you hear people going, I just, I don't even want to drink anymore. And you're like, BS, dude. Yeah. I don't, that will never be me. I can tell you, I literally, I mean, I made chocolate chip cookies last night for my mm -hmm. son and I didn't want them. Like there, part of me wants it. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, oh, that would, of course, if I ate it, it would taste good. But the value of that experience has just dissipated. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't, it, food was, the food that I was kind of addicted to was making me feel so bad mm -hmm. that I don't, I don't crave that anymore. Do you think of there are as, things. A, as an addiction for everybody or for some people? I mean, it no. certainly fits the bill in general not. to say people are sugar addicted or car. People like to make that claim, but there, you could look at yeah. it one way that our whole society is addicted and that they just don't well, know it. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other kind of subject really, in my opinion. But no, I mean, I am, I'm, I am 
wired for addiction for whatever reason I am. I don't have, I'm not good. Historically, I have not been good at moderation. Yeah. And I don't, that's one of the narratives I would like to change too, that I can. But I just kind of told myself until I am weight stable, until I've achieved some certain parameters that I'm just not gonna, mm-hmm. it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I've refined what I started eating to what I eat now so much too, that, you know, a cheat day for me might be a, some berries and some whipped cream or something like that. You, you know what I mean? 35 carbs that day. Not even yeah. still right. like, not like still not even, but, um, I, I haven't eaten any sugar or flour or anything like that. And I, I honestly don't want to, uh, my, everything's changed and I've had all that stuff before. I know what it's like to, to eat it <laughs> and I don't need to eat it again. I've eaten it so much. There's for, it's, it's just like booze. I don't need to drink again. I know what it's like. Yeah. I've experienced it. I don't need to keep experiencing that, especially when it's just harming my me and everyone around me. Yeah. And I know that's going to come across super extreme to some people and it doesn't have to be for you. Your thing is your thing. If you can handle it, you could eat a bite of cake every day and still be low carb if that's something you right. can handle. Exactly. You, you could, could do that. You could, you could have a an uh, you know, a 15 gram spoonful of, of cheesecake, real cheesecake or chocolate cake, and it would have, you know, 11 grams of carb in it. And yeah. You'd be okay. I mean, if you yeah. could do that, that'd be, you'd be totally good. Yeah. But you most people can't do that. Cookie every day right. if you want it. I don't like how it makes me feel. So I don't do that. Yeah. Um, and I still am just as into food as I've ever been. And, it's fun to be creative and figure out how to make. Well, that's what I'm kind of curious things. about is the kind of stuff that you are eating now, because I'm sure you've got some really good stuff. But how about the? Uh, so I think everybody's starting to in the culture come around to the idea, and it, golly, I mean, I've been I've been onto this diet a little bit, and understanding it since Atkins was a big thing. I mean, it's something I've, I've been aware of the general science and the effectiveness of, but when it was first like that it was really seen as a bad or dangerous or scary or taboo thing uh and and you just couldn't get anywhere with anybody talking about it and now and at that time nobody thought the the word carb didn't even have any bad association let's say 2003 i'm talking about yeah it just didn't people weren't really saying stuff bad about carbs now in the pop culture making fun of carbs and saying carbs are bad is now yeah. there. So that's actually a, totally. a, a neat step forward that if yeah. you, people no longer say carbs are bad. What are you talking about? Like at yeah. least people acknowledge that carbs are bad and then they go empty carbs and this and that. Yeah, They're yeah, still yeah. pretty defensive about certain amounts of carbs and what's the difference in sugar and carbs and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But one thing that hasn't moved almost at all is the way that people talk about fat like it needs to be avoided. That part's mm. still pretty large. It's, yeah, it's hard to find somebody. Fat yeah, saturated fat, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, That's actually something I've been reading the most about lately is sort of the politics behind the dietary guidelines and and who who decides what they think and what, what where the evidence is for all that. Mm-hmm. Um and you know the random controlled trials and the papers and that is very interesting to me it can get into it i'm just going to say this it can get into a borderline religious debate mm-hmm. on that level and even kind of conspiracy theorist type debates mm-hmm. which i really try to avoid that yeah, the people too. that i the people that i really like are practicing doctors and scientific authors and writers that just are 100% evidence based they don't um they don't seem to be you know working under any hidden agenda or anything like that to me at least i mean you you know i can i can only speculate so much but and are they di- are just, the people you're following differentiating saturated and unsaturated fat animal fat and not so the the fat thing is just one of the most frustrating things to me in the entire world because there even if saturated fat was unhealthy which I don't believe it is and I would love for someone to show me any published study that actually proved that it is it's 
the only way you can avoid eating it is if you eat modern toxic seed oils mm -hmm. that didn't exist 70 years ago. That's literally the only way you can avoid it. So that that starts being like just from it. Let's just look at it from a completely logic based thing. So you're telling me unless I eat this food that is scientifically generated in the last blip of well, human so vegetable existence, oil, then, for instance, yeah, so vegetable somebody seed, say the obvious thing would be well, vegetable seed oil oils. is good and and yeah. cow uh, steak fat, trimmings of steak yeah. fat. It's got to be worse than vegetable oil. Yeah. So, but why would why would our bodies be designed, or if you believe, you know, whatever you believe, evolved or whatever, to operate the most efficiently and productively in a synthetic food environment? Why would the foods that we would naturally be eating for thousands of years be the ones that kill us? Right. So that from that, and then all all foods literally that contain fat contain all three. Saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats, all of them. Olive oil has more saturated fat than unsaturated fat in it. Oh, they love and olive oil. So olive oil is not a, and the other, not a seed oil, though? It's not a synthetic. No. It's just no. pressed no. olive yeah. oil, right? Yep. But vegetable yeah. oil is synthetic. So Yeah, so if you can squeeze something and fat comes out of it, that's generally kind of a rule for safety for eating. But the, the also the term saturated fat means it, it, it's so fresh. This is when I learned this. I just about wanted to let me rip guess, out my hair. Let me guess before you do it. Uh, first of all, saturated sounds bad. <laughs> like, sounds really a bias bad. We've into the yes. saturated, and you know it comes from an animal, and you've got the built-in thing of eating the fat and it's decadent and all that stuff. So, and it's saturated. But the only thing is saturated about it is the the bond, the single hydrogen to the carbon bonds is all we're talking. It's about. actually you could actually also call saturated stable. Yeah. And unsaturated, unstable. Yeah. So you don't have dangling. Which, uh, yeah. So a lot of research going into saturated fats, not causing, uh, not oxidizing and not causing inflammation and unsaturated fats being highly inflammatory right. because of the oxidation they cause. So, and then the whole thing that eating saturated fat, well, also the whole concept that, that animal products are saturated fat and vegetable products are unsaturated unsaturated fat is a total myth as coconut well. Coconut oil. Just being an look example. it up. Look it up. Well, coconut oil is kind of an anomaly. The only food group that has more saturated fat than unsaturated fat is dairy. Mm -hmm. Coconut oil is obviously has more saturated fat than unsaturated fat. My doctor says don't eat meat. anything that is uh, solid at room temperature. She says avoid yeah. all of those, which. Yeah, which violates is what, what you're saying. So, uh, literally you know, the canola opposite. Oil, I would a tell palm someone to only eat fats that are solid at room right. temperature. <laughs> right. If you were going to go by that rule, I would literally do the opposite. There is no, there's just no evidence that it that it's harmful to eat this natural, mm -hmm. totally natural food that is what we've been eating, why we're here, why we survived. Is from if eating you're thinking this of food. hunter or gatherer, that would be it. You would eat high carb stuff when you can get it in season, and then you would be able to kill something between fasting for eight days. And now you got a yeah. big animal, and you're going to eat every bit of that animal's yeah. belly fat you could possibly consume, and be yep. very, very happy about it. Exactly. And I'm not going to go into why the dietary guidelines are the way they are because that's kind of delving into speculation. Yeah, yeah. People are familiar but with that. If you look at them, if you look at the line. That we they told us to eat lo less fat and more grains and plants and whole product whole foods. We did that. If you look at the data, we right. we, we, we and we lowered our fat yeah. and we ate it. And diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity went up exactly the same line as all that stuff went down. It just went up and up and up and up and up. It just the more we do what they say, the sicker we get. That's just a fact. Like you can't disprove it. Um, at least I, if you can, let me know. But I, I, I haven't. You found may any get some. You may. You've, you've you've asked for some feedback a couple of times. You may get some. But I'd love. Be, I would be good love. To I'll share it too. I'll read it if anybody sends it. I'm, I'm um, but non-conspiratorial so, here too. And and also, I want to really make clear. I eat a, a way that a lot of people would see as very extreme, and I was in an extreme situation. I was very broken. My blood pressure was through the roof. My A1C was through the roof. My weight was out of control. 
So I'm trying to fix something that was very broken and it kind of takes some extreme, I'm, you know, I don't know how I'm going to be eating 10 years from now, but I, I know what, you know, I don't know how far of a healing I can get to, or if I'm going to stay, I might stay eating the exact same way I am right now. But if you, if we were, if we well, were kind of left it alone and if we weren't told fat was bad and we weren't messing with the macros and getting the carbs way up to get the fat down and, and told that animals were bad to eat and we should lower our animal protein, all that stuff. Who knows where all these modern diseases would be right now mm -hmm. in our inner, you know, how, how, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's tragic to me, mm -hmm. especially the type two diabetes one to me. It's just people die of that. Oh yeah. It contributes. Every, to so, it's so weird. Yeah. The whole thing is such a weird cycle. Like you were talking about earlier where, <laughs> You're in the carbs, and then it triggers the hormones, and then it triggers this, and then you eat again, and then you feel bad, and then and then you know yeah. there's the negative. There's so many things that go into that cycle. It keeps keeps on spinning and spinning to where it just it, it's yeah. who knows. And then the long term effects in populations are the diseases that that are there and stuff like that. So let's get back to the nitty gritty because I find it unhelpful for people to try to minimize when they talk about eating fat like well no i mean you know i just like chicken breast and kale well no mm -hmm. let's in fact ch low fat chicken breast is 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 almost you know that's really high in protein which you only want a limited amount of protein like it's not even high protein that you're looking for it's actually high fat i find it better to acknowledge mm -hmm. that and not mm -hmm. be embarrassed about the fat fact that you're like cheddar cheese and ground beef if you're hungry mm -hmm. and that's okay mm -hmm. but give mm -hmm. me an example of what people find extreme that you eat or like to eat or what i think what i think the fat, when they see you or the you fat is the shot is shocking can be shocking to people um especially some days i kind of really try to listen to what my body wants and some days i eat a lot of fat like how do like, you consume like fat i track fat sometime i tracked my macros and i i could easily hit 180, 200 grams of fat in a day, mm -hmm. um, especially on a day where I feel like I need it. Um, butter, I make, um, I make my own ma mayo. I all these different kinds of mayos that I make, different and stuff. And what do you put them, them all? Um, burgers. I eat a lot of burgers. I eat a lot of steak. I eat a lot of eggs, bacon. Um, you know, chicken. I go through phases of things that I like and crave or whatever. You, you know, want to eat. Get chicken skin right off the rotisserie, you don't you? <laughs> yeah, I actually will do. I'll buy two, two uh, whole chickens and spatchcock them. You know, yeah. cut. You know, yeah. Butterfly them. Yeah, butterfly them. And and, and roast, roast them. them. And they're freaking awesome. But yes, a lot. I eat a lot of beef. I eat a lot of steak. I have a. I really try to listen, and then I also the. the the one thing I was actually kind of helping a friend get started on this, um, and he was just like, "No." The one thing I got from Dr. Naiman in 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 the Seattle area is I eat uh, a can of sardines pretty much. I, I love eating cans of sardines. I do the yeah. same thing when I'm eating. Yeah. And, and but I, let me confess, if you've seen me lately, I've been on tour, or if you see me sitting up here in the office, I ain't been eating good. I'm not. I'm eating carbs right now, and. I'll eat, I'll eat probably some ice cream and stuff tonight. But <laughs> when I'm eating keto, I, I control my weight with it and everything else. Then for sardines, is just is the best. It's super oh fatty, super good, re, re, pretty cheap. I just put mustard in them. Possibly and stuff. one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can eat. Nutrient-dense. That's what I'm always looking for. That's yeah. the other thing that drives me crazy is on the menus at all the restaurants, they have the calories listed. As if calories are the things you don't want. Yeah, and my whole mentality ever since I was able to buy food is I'm looking for the highest caloric <laughs> density in a food. I've always thought that was the obvious way. That'd be like, uh, it's, it's fuel. Like, you don't want watered-down gas, do you? I'm trying to find the best fuel for the cheapest. So I want the most calories in a food that I'm seeking. Yeah. That's the way I always yeah, I mean, that. So, Ted, the same guy, same doctor, Ted Naiman, he, he, I've heard him say, that nutrient density is the problem. If we were all yeah, eating that's right. foods that were high in nutrient density, yes. we would be eating correctly. And, and none of these things would be a problem. Volume, a lot you, less yeah, volume. You'd be, yeah, you, if you just ate super high nutrient density foods, you'd be good. Yeah. You know? 
So and I mean, eat a cucumber. There, there's for instance, no, has like, you know, a pickle has five uh, calories yeah. in it. So yeah. I, now there's nothing wrong with that, but that's what you eat with the mayo and the oils and the fats with it. Mm-hmm. It's good to eat that, and there's there's yeah. nutrients in cucumbers. But I was just thinking about it. Like if you want to say, oh, I just got to eat light and eat veggie. How many? Yeah. How many pickles do you have to eat in a day to get two thousand calories? <laughs> do you know, it's like five hundred pickles. Yeah. It's four hundred pickles actually. You'd have to eat 400 pickles to get your 2,000 calories. Go ahead or eat 10 pickles and a couple of cans of sardines, and you'll be in good yeah. shape, and it'll taste yeah. good, and you'll be full, and you'll like yep. it. Yeah, that's the other thing is the fat um, really kicks in your satiety. Mm-hmm. Like you stay full for so long, and you just feel good. And you can you eat just, a bag of Doritos, you can, and you're just as hungry as you were before. You know? Slow. You yeah, twelve hundred oh, yeah. calories of Doritos, and you are absolutely every bit as hungry as when you started the bag. Absolutely, hundred percent. You cannot yeah, I mean, do that, that with ribeye, which is ribeye the steak. No, you, like. you can't. Yeah, that's what I mostly yeah. eat. You can't sit down. I can sit down and eat all the cookies that I made, mm-hmm. but I can't and still sit be down and, and eat this much ribeye. No, you know what I mean. Right. You just you don't you just don't eat that much. Your body goes, nope, you're full. Yeah, we're good. So, yeah. We got some good nutrients in this thing. We got a lot of fat. There's mm-hmm. some protein, whatever. I mean, there's carbs in the Everything. meat of the of the ribeye, by the way. I mean, there's some yeah, stored in of there. Of course, so. there's incidental carbs. Um, yeah. Uh, how are you cooking ribeye? Like, what's what's your go to way to make a steak and eat it? My go to steak, which I believe to be the most foolproof. I mean, I love grilling, and I grill. I grilled today. That's why I was late getting on here. <laughs> but um. Is is you put a cast iron pan under the broiler for ten minutes, let it get hot, throw a ribeye in there, put it back. About four minutes later, flip it over. Four minutes later, pull it out, let it rest, and it's done. That's what I'm gonna do tonight. It's, it's absolutely foolproof. Mm-hmm. And the the key is is a full ten minutes of that under there. So that the, the surface temperature is super high. It's on so the cast hot, iron, and you're hitting yeah. it from both sides. Yeah. And you yeah. can really render a bunch of the fat out, and it gets that cast iron yeah. just crazy, like, sear. But it's a really even cook. It's it's the fastest, most reliable way and for And it's not as messy on your steak. stovetop. Because I like cooking on cast oh, iron, yeah. but it's spl- so splattery, you know, kind of thing. And oh, yeah, it's, it's hard, super you know? easy. It's it, it does make some smoke, so you have to be careful, like... If you you know you have to have good ventilation or mm-hmm. your smoke alarm will go off. But, but the conduction on the cast iron is so good because it's instead of grill marks, the whole thing is getting yeah. the conduction yep. from the cast yeah. iron. I love you get it. The, you know the effect there all the way across it, but that's real good. Um, and so, are you talking about the intermittent fasting? You're skipping lunch a lot. You get up and eat some eggs and then eat. No, I don't. Good. I don't eat breakfast usually. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty rare that I do. So your fast I, I, starts, at, you know, late at night. You eat some. Uh, I imagine you have. What is your sweet treat that you eat? Like, you know, f- use artificial sweetener and cream or something, or make a yeah, carb ice cream. Every, every once in a while, I make like chocolate mousse or something mm-hmm. like that with this stuff called Swerve. Have you ever heard of Swerve? Yep. Yeah. Swerve and heavy cream and cocoa powder is yep. really all you need, and a couple other things you oh, can so use. E- some even gelatin. a cup of sour cream with cocoa powder is good. Yeah. Yep. Which people yeah, find so, offensive. But like I, you I eat don't sour do that. With a spoon, but you could do it. I I don't do that a lot. My I get a little messed up by artificial sweeteners sometimes mentally. You know, I don't I don't think there's an I've I've never noticed them to throw me off physically, but they can kind of make me start thinking, feeling kind of really fake, hangry kind of feelings hmm. sometimes. But um, uh, so you fast from t- nine p.m. until. No, I see. So, okay. So I kind of, for me, I've learned that I really do the best like sleep wise and stuff. If I, if I really try to be done eating around six o'clock at night. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so sometimes seven or eight sometimes, but it just depends. You know, I was really militant about the fasting thing too, because what'll happen is you'll kind of you get something down and you'll kind of hit a bump and lose, you know, or you'll hit a thing and lose some weight and then you'll kind of, kind of slow down and you're like, what's, did I do something wrong? Or so then I'll kind of get into something else, some new kind of aspect of it, like intermittent fasting. Dr. Jason Fung in uh, Canada is like the intermittent fasting guru. He's freaking awesome. And uh, I've just watched a bunch of his videos and stuff. And uh, 
And I was like really into it. And I was kind of being really militant about it. I was like trying to figure out, okay, if I do three eight hour windows and one four hour and a 24 and, or, and, you know, or two four hours and a 24, like, and, uh, I emailed some, a doctor that I, and asked him advice. And he's like, this is what I do, but just chill, like try to be flexible, like just don't be mm-hmm. so crazy about it. Like it's it's all about kind of the flow, listening to your body. The The main reason I don't eat breakfast is because I don't ever want it. I'm not hungry when I wake up in the morning. It's just the, your whole response system of like your brain saying you're hungry and all that is totally different and stable and just uh-huh. chill. Um and then I'll do longer ones sometimes. Like I'll do a f- only a four hour window of eating. Like I'll do that a couple times a week. And I, I don't really plan it out either. I'll just be like, oh, after I eat lunch or something, I'll be like, today I'm going to be done eating it. Well, four. how do you plan on a good lunch then at noon? You know, preparation if you're out and about, stuff like that. You just take a break and cook. You're working from home. So that is that is the biggest challenge. I had a week here where my brother was here working on this record uh, that we're doing and doing some photos where we were eating out and, and I, I usually don't eat out so because I work at home and I don't eat out. So eating out really can throw me off uh, the time, time wise, timing wise. Um, it's easy for me to eat out. I can eat just about anywhere, but like other, you know, sometimes I'll eat, I'll eat at 11 and then at four and I'll never eat again. And that's, those are two times that most people don't eat at. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I'm with other people, they can, it's, I gotta. I have to adapt, move around. So, if I know I'm going into a session with a bunch of people, I'll make myself eat breakfast. I'll just move my window of eating to where I'm gonna be with normal eating yeah. people. <laughs> so it'll so you work. Be flexible there. You yeah. know, I like that definition of flexibility. Uh, I, you know, some people say it this way. I think it was when I was learning about how to feed a, a damn baby or something. They're like, mm-hmm. you have to be flexible. You have to have a routine, and then you can break it all you want. That's what being flexible yep. is. It's about having the routine that when yeah. you change it for any reason, almost indiscriminately, it goes back. Yeah. That the, the, the part about flexibility there. is yep. that you come back to yeah. the 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 normal awesome. mode in the first place, and that's what it means to be flexible. Not mm. you do whatever is not the yeah. uh, it's not the best way to look at flexibility. And I love that. So then, if you're doing that and you're doing the fasting and all that stuff, you don't have any. Uh, you don't have any like what are the other health problems and stuff that have gone away for you? Like tell me all the things that are okay. Um, I used to, pr- I probably would have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. I never really got checked. Mm-hmm. It was bad though. It was really bad. Snoring, mm-hmm. uh, just kind of tired all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Ne- like always, especially just having to having to drink coffee at, hey. throughout the whole day to keep keep it going. Um, my joints hurt, uh, you know, just sort of puffy, inflamed kind of feeling all the time. Um, all that's gone. Like I literally don't even snore anymore, like at all. It's crazy. Um, which obviously has to do with weight loss, but it also, I, I think a lot of this stuff comes with the inflammation going down too i think Do we're kind of walking around because the gluten people will jump on here and say this because you're not eating gluten i don't know i don't know about that but you're I don't, just incidentally I don't, not eating gluten because you don't eat flour well yeah but it's I, I i believe that the entire insulin exposure process that we get from the standard american diet is just highly in, in, inflammatory mm-hmm. and then you add the the polyunsaturated oils into the mix and then you're it's just a recipe for disaster um there's a bunch of guys there's a guy named um hold on i'm gonna look really quick because i don't want to say his name wrong in australia nofructose.com is his website Mm -hmm. um dr fetke i believe is how you say his name he has He's awesome. He's an orthopedic surgeon in Australia and Tasmania, I believe. And he he has a video on YouTube um, 
that explains the whole kind of perfect storm of the polyunsaturated oils. Yeah, it's. I think if you type in Dr. Fat Key YouTube, there's a, a nutritional model of inflammation is the first video that comes up. Um, it's pretty amazing. All of his videos are. Oh, no, nutrition and inflammation, the one from the low carb down to under, that is the best one. It the uh, the the perfect storm of ba these bad fats, high carbs, mm -hmm. um, and the inflammation. You know, it's pretty compelling stuff. I'm not saying that it's you know proven mm -hmm. by any means, but it's it's very compelling to me. It makes sense, and I and I I like I said personally, I. I experienced it not not just the body fat reduction but just like mm -hmm. but just p general puffiness and yeah. everything is, is gone and then now yeah I work I work out um I which I've never done literally with any regularity in my entire life until about six months ago yeah um, the, the tired one stuck out to me because I forgot about it. I've been eating poorly for a, a while now and I've been complaining about how tired I am I forgot that that's probably tied to it you know oh like, absolutely I, I keep thinking what is going on is the baby keeping me up am I yeah what is going on oh I'm getting I was thinking about how I must have entered some other stage of I'm old you know how old men always yeah. have to take naps or something which I don't like yeah. taking naps so I was thinking am I really going that way what's going on but you know I think that could be a big part of it because I've been eating it, it, absolutely so. it's crazy Matt I when I when I got that call from my doctor about my A1C Oh, I never told you the, the end of that, too, which is crazy. When I got that call about my A1C being 6.2, I really was depressed. I went into really bad depression. I ate a bunch of crap and gained more weight, like I said. And I really had this feeling like, well, you know, the best is behind me, and it wasn't that great. <laughs> like, it was a kind of a bummer yeah. from a physical health mm -hmm. standpoint, you know? I don't mean my life. I just mean my phys physical health standpoint. And I literally feel better than I can remember ever mm -hmm. feeling right now. Like that's exciting. And and maybe I didn't appreciate it, you know, when I was a kid or whatever, you know, because it just was. But so check. This is the craziest part. Two months after I started this. Okay, so now keep in mind that your A1C is roughly a three-month average, the test, mm -hmm. okay? Two months after I started eating like this, I got another blood test, which means that you have to factor in one month of really bad eating because mm -hmm. I was eating really bad right before I stopped, eat, like started this. My A1C was down to 5.5. From 6.8 or something. From 6.2. 6.2. Which is... Which is five point, or it was like five two five or five three five. I forget the exact number. It was normal, totally normal. Not even pre diabetic anymore. Like completely normal. In two months. I mean, I, in two months. I mean, it's, it's just that was like, he. My doctor was like, I don't know what you're doing. I don't see this ever. I never see it go down. How how is that? I don't. He's understand like, whatever that. you're doing, just keep doing it. So my doctor, when I went in. You know, I, I went into my doctor and told her I got blood tests when I was starting. I was like, I'll get the baseline here. And um, I told her what I was doing. She goes, that's fine. And that's when she told me not to eat saturated fats. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm going to try this, though. <laughs> like, I just want you to know I, I am going to do this. She goes, yeah, okay, but try to eat the least of those. It's okay if you want to restrict your carbs some. And uh, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, this, I mean, I, I'll come back. We'll, t we'll test it, you know, and then I came back three months later and she told me my, gave me my whole lipid profile and told me everything was wrong with it and stuff. Th some concerns here, there came back and everything 